R.L. Stein has maintained forever that he's never used Ghostwriters for Goosebumps, that every book in the series is 100% from him. I'm not calling him a liar, but it feels like a lie. Partially because all of these monthly pulp young person novels all used Ghostwriters. Even K.A. Applegate, who was secretly two authors in a trench coat, couldn't keep up with the grind and started using Ghostwriters about halfway into Animorphs. But more than that, the quality fluctuates in ways that are better explained with multiple writers than just the one. Having read over half of the original Goosebumps series, I now know that there are actual good Goosebumps books. Stein has good, interesting, creative ideas, and he can totally execute those ideas in a solid fashion that suggests he knows things like story structure and character arcs and themes. None of these books are masterpieces, but some of them at least feel written. But then you get books that feel like they were scribbled down by sewer monsters that have never seen the sun, let alone read another book. And the most egregious example of this is the Monster Blood series. Books full of unlikable, badly written characters, absurd situations with little sense of logic, and zero interest in continuity, to the point where you have to wonder why we bothered making sequels in the first place. I mean, why are we already up to Monster Blood 3? I know we've got a bunch of living dummy sequels coming up, couldn't we have done one of those? Why did R.L. Stein think Monster Blood was the winning series here? If he doesn't use ghostwriters of wildly different qualities, then there's something about writing Monster Blood books that gives Stein brain worms. And it'd be one thing if it started bad but got better with every iteration, like The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb was crap but Return of the Mummy was a notable improvement. But no, somehow these Monster Blood books get worse. So Monster Blood 3. We are once again saddled with Evan as our protagonist, and not a lot has changed since Monster Blood 2. He's still living in Atlanta, still friends with Andy, and still being antagonized by school bully Conan Barber, a name I will never get over. The big wrinkle this time is that Evan is a regular babysitter for his cousin, an eight-year-old boy named Kermit. Kermit is a science prodigy, mixing up chemicals in his basement to unique, though oftentimes destructive effects. Kermit once melted Evan's shoes, and Evan isn't really keen on having to keep going over. Evan climbed down from the stool. Mrs. Ross pushed a hand gently through his curly, carrot-colored hair. It's nice of you to help out, she said softly. Aunt Dee can't really afford a babysitter. Put a pin in that. We'll be coming back to it a few times. Now, Evan thinks Kermit is a pain in the ass, just a real jerk, but Evan is notoriously the whiniest shit to grace one of these books, so forgive me if I don't believe him right away. Kermit also happens to live next door to Conan, the bully, and the book starts with Conan antagonizing Evan as he walks to Kermit's house. Kermit comes out with a beaker of liquid, and when Conan doesn't back off, he throws the substance on Conan's shirt. The blue liquid oozed down the front of Conan's muscle shirt. All three boys stared at it in silence. Well, I'm not disappearing, Conan murmured, narrowing his eyes suspiciously at Kermit. Then his shirt started to shrink. Hey! Conan cried angrily. He struggled to pull up the shrinking shirt. It got tinier and tinier. It, it's choking me! Conan shrieked. Wow! Kermit squeaked, his black eyes flowing excitedly behind his glasses. This is cool! Evan gazed in amazement as the muscle shirt shrank down to a tiny shred of cloth, and then it vanished completely. Now Conan stood in front of them bare-chested. A heavy silence fell over the backyard. All three of them stared at Conan's broad, bare chest for a few moments. Conan broke the silence. That was my best muscle shirt, he told Evan through gritted teeth. Uh-oh, Evan muttered. So Conan beats up Evan, even though it was Kermit who destroyed his shirt with magic shrink juice. But stranger than that, Evan is mad at Kermit. Not because Kermit made the situation worse, but because he thinks Kermit was intentionally trying to get Evan in more trouble with Conan. Which is just not how the scene reads. There is nothing in Kermit's behavior that would suggest that he wasn't trying to scare off Conan. And Kermit had to have known that there was a risk of Conan turning on him. When I first read this, what I thought was happening was... Since Evan is a long-established shit, he was taking out his frustration on Kermit, even though Kermit didn't deserve it. But 
No, that's not what's happening. As we'll see later, Kermit actually is the brat Evan says he is, and Kermit really did intend to aggravate Conan to get Evan beat up. But you would never get that from how the first couple of chapters are written. Right off the bat, this book fails at communicating character motivation. And he starts getting involved with babysitting Kermit after that, coming over to the house whenever Evan's there. We start to see Kermit actually act like a jerk, pretending the substances he's mixing are going to explode and then laughing when Evan ducks for cover. Because R.L. Stein seems to think that pranks are currency for kids. Are you under the age of 14? Then you just be pranking 24-7. There isn't a lot of plot for the first oh, half of this book. It's mostly just Kermit, Evan, and Andy dicking around in Kermit's basement while Kermit throws together different concoctions. Kermit's dog, Dogface, has hiccups, and Kermit tries to make a hiccup cure. It's a very simple hiccup cure, Kermit said, pouring a blue liquid into a green liquid. It's just magnesium hyposprite with robotussel polythrombitol, with a little sugar for sweetness. Now, I'm not going to harp on the technobabble science as Kermit mixes a bunch of made-up words together, and I'm not going to get all cinema sins about the impossible substances Kermit is mixing up. It's a children's book. This is some appropriately fantastical stuff. I'm fine with the shrink formula and all that. But you don't give dogs sugar. It won't poison them like chocolate, but giving dogs added sugar can give them serious upset stomachs. Hey, Stein, could we just not fuck around with dogs for a bit? Also, where is Kermit getting all these chemicals for his experiments? You can't walk into a Walmart and ask for a bottle of pure sodium. You have to get this kind of stuff mail ordered, some of it in hazmat deliveries. And that's not cheap. Kermit's not buying these substances for both financial and legal reasons, so his mom has to be doing it. How is it that Kermit's mom, Aunt Dee, can't afford a babysitter but can afford to keep Kermit's chemical cabinet well stocked? Anyway, Kermit's hiccup cure works, but has the added side effect of making the large dog hyperactive like a puppy, and Dogface starts running around the house, wrecking up shop. When Aunt Dee comes home to find the house wrecked, Kermit blames Evan, saying Evan was teasing the dog and causing it to act out. This gets Evan upset. Also, Andy lets Kermit do her math homework for her, and it turns out that Kermit intentionally got all of the questions wrong. This gets Andy upset. Though, in fairness, that one's on her. So they're both upset, and they both want to get back at Kermit. And since they're both uncreative dunces, that means breaking out the monster blood. You may remember Andy's parents buying a can of monster blood during their trip in Germany, continuing to fracture the monster blood continuity into tiny little pieces. For those who need a refresher course, in the first book, Monster Blood itself wasn't a supernatural item. It was just a decades-old slime toy that was cursed by a sexy cat witch into growing beyond control. This got jettisoned in the second book. Now the destructive, ever-growing Monster Blood is both somehow a mass-produced toy and has mysterious unknown origins. You'd think the Consumer Product Safety Commission would have been all over this stuff. Anyway, it's one of the most broken retcons I've seen in a book series, but it means we have a fresh can of monster blood to fuck around with. And then Evan and Andy change their minds. It takes, uh, it takes way too long for the plot to actually pop off. Kermit has to one-up himself by spiking Evan and Andy's orange sodas with some of the Joker's laughing toxin so that they can't stop laughing. Then Conan shows up, and when Evan won't stop laughing at him, Evan gets beat up again. And then Aunt Dee gets mad for Evan for drinking her orange soda. Okay, guys, we're 55 pages into this 126-page book. Can we please get this story going? We, we can? Awesome. So here's their plan. They go to Kermit's, wait until he's mixing something, and then Evan distracts the little scientist by eating his favorite candy bar in front of him. Then, while Kermit is looking away, Andy slips some of the tiniest bit of monster blood into Kermit's mixture. The intention is to see the mixture grow and for Kermit to freak out. Uh, question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. Kermit's mixing a doughy substance, so when Andy slips a bit of the monster blood in, the consistency isn't that off. And it works. The dough stuff starts to expand and expand and expand, making a huge bubble of dough reaching up to the basement ceiling before exploding, covering everyone and everything in the room. 
Kermit pulled out a cloth and cleaned his glasses. What a mess, he declared, gazing around the room. Evan, you're going to be in major trouble when Mom gets home. Evan swallowed hard. He had forgotten about Kermit's mom. She had given him one last chance to prove that he was a good babysitter. Now she was going to come home to a basement splattered with sticky yellow goop from floor to ceiling. And Kermit was sure to tell her the whole situation was Evan's fault. Aunt Dee will tell everyone in the world why she had to take the job away from me, Evan thought unhappily. Then I'll never get another babysitting job as long as I live. So? Like, so what? I know Evan is young and is over-exaggerating, that's fine, but A, Evan hates doing this because Kermit is awful, eventually, and B, he's getting grossly underpaid for his work because, remember, Aunt D can't afford a regular babysitter. It's kind of hard to feel sorry for Evan in the moment when we should have quit this bullshit gig weeks ago. Go mow lawns, Evan. Lawns can't pull pranks on you. It's, it's good work. Anyway, during the explosion, some of the monster blood dough substance got into Evan's open mouth. And before you can get off a Kel Mitchell, ah, here goes, Evan starts growing. The books treat this as a unique sensation, seemingly forgetting that Evan ate monster blood and grew into a giant in the climax of the last book. Soon enough, the young teen's head is pressed against the basement ceiling. Andy's face brightened. The monster blood splashed on your clothes, too. That was lucky. They're growing with you. <sighs> you know, Book, I wasn't going to question it, because I get it. You can't have a story about a giant, naked 13-year-old boy. At least not without attracting an audience you do not want to attract. This is why Kay Applegate introduced the skin-tight clothing rule in Animorphs, so that it wasn't a 24-7 nude fest. I was more than willing to suspend my disbelief on this. But now you've brought attention to it, so I'm gonna have to address it, because when you're made to actually think about it, it's nonsense. First, it's inconsistent. Monster Blood has never worked this way. It doesn't make anything it touches grows. It grows, and anything that consumes it grows. But if you got some monster blood on, like a Prince Charles and Princess Diana commemorative plate, you're not suddenly going to have a giant commemorative plate. If it worked like that, everything in the basement would be fucked. Everything got coated. We see Andy wringing the substance out of her hair and stuff. You could make the case that the monster blood was absorbed by the fabric of Evan's clothing, but that's also not reflective in previous books. In the first Monster Blood, Evan falls into an entire bathtub of Monster Blood, nearly drowning in the stuff, and his clothes didn't grow after that. On the flip side, in Monster Blood 2, when Evan ate Monster Blood so that he could grow giant to fight Cuddles the Monster Hamster, his clothes grew with him. No explanation given, but I was fine with that, because again, let's not make naked boy books. Another argument you can make is that the Monster Blood's effects have changed after interacting with Kermit's dough formula stuff, but again, it got everywhere. So at the very least, Kermit and Andy's clothes should be growing as well. This is one of those things that's only a problem if you draw attention to it, so good job, Book, you drew attention to it. Evan struggles to get out of the basement, straight up breaking a wall before spilling out into the backyard. Evan glances into Conan's backyard, and what in the world is going on? Evan lumbered over to the fence and peered into Conan's yard. He saw Conan Barber furiously swinging a baseball bat, swinging it hard, forcing a little boy and girl to back up against the fence. Let us go, the little girl screamed. Why are you so mean? Conan swung the bat, bringing it close to the boy and girl, making them cry out. I'm sorry. What the fuck is going on? Did Conan kidnap two children? This is such bizarrely psychotic behavior. Like, bullies are assholes, but I'm like 90% convinced Conan intends to kill these children. Evan, now a giant, thankfully steps in and saves the kids, forcefully taking the back away from Conan and dumping him into a tree. This starts the power fantasy part of the book, showing kids how awesome it would be to be huge and strong. The problem is that this is happening around page 80, way too late for such a short book. But Evan starts walking around town with Andy and Kermit in tow. 
Evan doesn't seem to be growing anymore, but it's really hard to get a sense of how big he actually is. At one point, he says he's two stories tall, which would put him around 16 feet, but then there's a scene where he crushes a car he didn't see under his foot, which would require him to be much bigger than that. At one point, he compares holding a baseball bat to holding a drinking straw. Now, the regulation length for a baseball bat is 42 inches, while the average length of a drinking straw is 7 inches, suggesting that Evan is 6 times larger than what he once was. I don't know Evan's actual height, but the average height for a 13 year old boy is 60 inches, or 5 feet, which would make him around 30 feet tall. Evan's walk through town eventually brings him to the park, where some kids are playing baseball. They're shocked by Evan's presence, but lets him play with them because, um, being 30 feet tall would seem like a detriment to playing baseball. You can't hold the ball right, the strike zone would be like 20 feet, and also you're running a lot, and if you step on anyone, their soup's dead. I guess basketball would have been too cliché. But the game is cut short when two fire trucks and a bunch of police show up, led by Conan. It seems he called law enforcement and convinced them that a giant was terrorizing the neighborhood. Goosebumps is a book series where adults not believing children is its bread and butter, but somehow Conan makes it work. And these guys are coming in hot, weapons drawn, ready to kill what is clearly a child. A large child, but a child wearing sneakers and jeans. And, well, I expect that from the police, the psychopathic squad who thinks de-escalation is a dirty word, but the firefighters are, have fucking hatchets drawn. Hatchets! Like they were the criminal gang in a kung fu action movie. Evan makes a run for it and eventually winds up back in Kermit's backyard. The kids are like, what do we do? And then are like, oh wait, we established a shrinking formula at the beginning of the book. What follows is a long, repetitive scene of Kermit running inside his house, mixing together his shrinking formula, Evan using it and it having some unintended effects. It turns his skin blue, it makes him grow feathers. They go through this cycle three times. Finally, Kermit makes a formula that works, and Evan shrinks down to his normal size, just in time for Aunt Dee to come home. Whew, yay, just in time, now we won't get in trouble. I guess we'll just ignore the dough mess in the basement and the wall Evan destroyed. The book ends with Evan going to sleep, but waking up in the middle of the night to discover that he shrunk even further and is now the size of an action figure. Cool, fine, whatever. We're done with another dumb, dumb monster blood book. I suppose, in comparison to the others, this is the uh, least bad of the three so far, but only by virtue that it has the fewest moving parts. It's the most simple of the books, but it's still pretty dang bad. It still has the awful characters from the previous books while continuing the gradual disintegration of continuity. But I think the core issues of this book come down to ill use of the book's new character, Kermit, and just horrible pacing overall. I suppose it's time we get into the if I wrote it section of the video, and I'm going to approach it as if Monster Blood 1 and 2 are as they are, ignoring the suggestions I made in those videos. So my main thing, can we just let Kermit be a good kid, if awkward and eccentric? Instead of antagonizing his cousin, what if he wanted to hang out with Evan, but was kind of annoying about it and his experiments kind of ruined things? I think. Kid Scientist is a fun, if cartoony, character to add to the ensemble, but making him the antagonist pushes the character away and keeps the reader from enjoying his antics. It's obvious that the real antagonist should be Conan, the bully who tried to murder two children with a baseball bat for some reason. So here's my idea. Evan keeps having conflicts with Conan every time he comes over to babysit Kermit. Kermit wants to help against the bully. But he comes up with these wacky things, the shrinking potion, something that turns your skin blue, but it keeps backfiring. It only makes the situation worse. Evan is mad at Kermit all the time because Evan is a shit, but then one day Andy mentions something called monster blood and Kermit is curious and eventually gets the story of monster blood out of her. This very much interests Kermit. He wonders about monster blood's scientific properties. Can I see some? he asks. Andy at first says no, 
but then remembers that they have that can of deactivated monster blood, the stuff that stopped working because it went past its expiration date. Well, there's no harm in having Kermit look at this stuff, Andy thinks, and gives him some of the dead monster blood. But Kermit is a super genius and figures out how to reactivate it. Now he can help Evan fight off Conan, so he spikes some of Evan's food with a rejuiced monster blood. Evan grows large, hijinks ensue. In the real book, Kermit never even discovers what monster blood is. Why would you keep the mad scientist chemistry kid away from the magic growing substance? What do you have against obvious fun, Stein? Have Evan grow a lot earlier in the book, so that you can have time to enjoy it more. Let's have more of an adventure too. Let's say that Kermit knows exactly how to reverse the effects of monster blood, but doesn't have the chemicals to do it. So Evan, Andy, and Kermit use Evan's new height to break into a lab somewhere. Also, like, give Andy something to do. She's only in this book because she's in the previous two, but she has nothing to do. Maybe she's the one who gets big instead. Evan had his turn in Monster Blood 2. It's Andy's turn. I don't know, the, the previous two books will always have you at a disadvantage, but I think it's salvageable if you actually try. I just... Why? Why Monster Blood? What is it about this concept that keeps it coming back, but somehow never getting better? How is there one more of these after this? I give Monster Blood 3 a poo emoji out of 10.